tonight, uh, which is going to be the round table. So I would want first to call all our speakers of today uh, to take uh, a seat right here at this high table there. Um, unfortunately, Asia and Kim are sorry, they apologize, they had uh, not our obligations, they have not been able to stay and take part in this round table, so we're going to miss them. But I'm sure we're going to have a, a lot of pleasure uh, having Mr. Yves Grenier, which I welcome also on the floor now, and who will animate this round table. Uh, Yves Grenier is a seasoned business reporter currently working at uh, La Liberté. He has been a business writer uh, for many papers in the past, such as Le Temps and La Géfi. Uh, he is the author of two interesting books, which I haven't read, but they sound definitely interesting, which are The End of the Swiss Banking Secrecy, so I guess quite a well-known topic, and another one, which is very interesting, Swiss Franc Fragility of a Strong Currency. Interesting perspective. Uh, and Yves will now animate the round table with our speaker, so I leave you the floor. So this is the last, the last step of uh, a very interesting uh, afternoon. And thank you very much for all uh, the people who have uh, the, the courage to stay uh, any longer. So after having heard so many very enlightening conferences and speeches, I have to confess that even business journalists are not experts on that, uh, on that topic. So they and their only task is to try to inform the public the best that they can. So my questions will be the, uh, the questions of the general public, and uh, I'm trying to get my experts answering the most, uh, uh, the most quickly and the most uh, simply in order to, to allow any, uh, everyone to understand what they say and what they mean. Um, my first question, it, which is addressed to, to all of you, is that we have seen that uh, fraud, cyber fraud, cyber crime is a multi-billion US dollars or euros or francs or whatever uh, business. And most of all, <coughs> it's a very fast rising <coughs> business. So is there any hope to see it one day uh, efficiently tackled or even eradicated, let's spare the, the, the big words, uh, to through the instruments you are developing. Who wants to answer that first question? <laughs> Mr. De Coronia, you're first. <laughs> first in line. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'll, I'll have to disappoint you. I don't think we'll be able to eradicate it. Have we been able to eradicate fraud in general over 2,000 years? No. So we will not do this. Uh, the second, yes, we will definitely be able to reduce it. I think yeah, I agree that it won't be eradicated, but the second issue, I guess uh, it's important, is the trade-off between the false positive and false negative. I mean, what does it mean to, to fight fraud? It means that at a certain moment, since you will be always in an uncertain environment, you won't have all the information, you run always the risk of making an error. And so I think this is very important to understand that in general, if we start using automatic tools, of putting costs on the false positive and false negative. And this is important for fraud, but also for self-driving car. A and this is goes back to humans, to ethics. I mean, do we prefer to be harassed because our car uh, was supposed to be fraudulent or we prefer to lose money? I mean, at the end of the day, we have to, to put numbers on. And this, I think, it's something we should think about. We shouldn't hope that there is a magic machine putting zero to zero. We should take our responsibility in putting numbers on that if we want to put numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in my point of view, um, if I take the bank as an example, uh, the bank um, is mutating now. There are a lot of uh, digital transformation on every bank. Uh, I guess those uh, digital transformation will help uh, the banks to improve their plan. So. Even if we cannot eradicate, I'm sure we can decrease at least and, and be more safe, safer um, to, uh, to, 
fight uh, Toads 2. Um, I agree with uh, previous uh, commentators. I think um, we are in a cat and mouse game. Um, we have seen in the past that, for example, when it comes to credit card fraud, there were different types of fraud that we managed to eradicate. In the meantime, we have, uh, of course, different means for payment. We have digital payments, we have e-commerce that has appeared at some point. Then we saw fraudsters moving from skimming, for example, copying uh, the credit card data uh, on location to e-commerce, which was much more profitable and much more um, much easier to do for them. And then we had to change our direction as well. And I guess once we tackle this problem sufficiently well, we will have a new product, a new uh, maybe um, a market, maybe a different um, type of cyber attack that we would uh, have to address. Fraud has been a part of the history of mankind. And uh, the essence of fraud is uh, cheat people and deceiving money and taking the property. So mm, in my view, actually completely conquer fraud is kind of too abstract. So I can say there were a foster and there is a foster and there will be, but only what we can concentrate to is what kind of fraud is it is because we can concentrate on certain types of fraud and we can eradicate it, I can say. For example, let's say about the DEC crime again, business email compromise. We didn't have that kind of fraud once, but now we are confronting that kind of fraud. So at least if we can concentrate with a certain proper manners, we can conquer and we can eradicate DEC types fraud but it's gonna happen on other types of fraud, and we will fight again. Thank you. Yeah, but mm, we can see, so uh, your answers are either encouraging nor uh, discouraging, but uh, it's some way in the, in, in the middle. But um, the big questions uh, the public uh, wishes to, to ask, especially to the people who are proposing us uh, very nice solutions, is uh, that, uh, are you really, uh, did you really find the, 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 the core, the heart of the way to, 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 to identify any kind of risk? Uh, I mean, for instance, like everyone, I have a, I have a credit card and uh, like everyone, it has been rejected at times because uh, for uh, a lot of sorts of reasons, I have not enough funds on my card because I've spent too much or uh, sometimes uh, because uh, for unknown reasons. And uh, as you mentioned, it can annoy the, the customer. Isn't that sometimes a glitch of the, the result of a glitch of the, of the system? And uh, to enhance my question, uh, isn't that kind of glitches ways for fraudsters to go through the system? So this is the, the, f the first part of, of my question is for you. And uh, the others feel free to answer to your part as well. Um, I think what you described is inherent to the system. Uh, I would uh, agree with you what you said before, that in the end we're talking about the cost. Do we want to um, uh, bear the cost of a fraudulent transaction or the cost of an annoyed customer? There is not a perfect solution. As, uh, and if you're referring to AI, I guess with the current means, we can reduce both fraud and false positives, but we cannot um, achieve uh, perfection. So please speak more uh, in sorry. your mic. Uh, but we cannot achieve perfection. Now, um, what, what, we, what we have seen in the past is that uh, in certain cases, one method alone can achieve um, let's say, um, uh, reduction, but with combination with a completely different method, you can really uh, tackle a problem. Uh, for example, when it comes to skimming, we had 
in the past these so-called retrats, these are the machines that were just copying credit cards uh, using this, uh, I don't know how we even work with this uh, uh, thing, how do you say? Yeah. Um, and then uh, at some point the chip was integrated in the card and you managed to eradicate this thing. This has nothing to do with AI. So AI comes as a step two or three in this process. You have other processes uh, before that, the, the chip, maybe the, the, the PIN biometric nowadays when you do digital transactions that try to prevent fraud. Yeah. So this is a combination of different tools to, to solve this problem. And I, uh, yes, so the same questions for uh, uh, an insurer and a banker. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think our aim is to become more resilient. In the in the and what by do I mean by that is that the consequences of those acts are not going to affect us too much. Uh, to take your example, um, I have two credit cards. Mm. <laughs> and usually one is, if one is refused, the other one works. So I think th is, is similarly, yeah, it's yeah. diversification. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, our aim should be to become more resilient to those problems uh, in general. And, and that's how we will cope with this almost inevitable effect that you change the method, you have new things, then people will try, uh, as, as you were saying, Jig, they will come with another step. They will have to fight against it and then another one. But at the end, what we don't want is that those scams, they destroy our society, they destroy our way of of living and our well-being in general. Yes, but they are part of history. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Sweeney. Um, I do not have an answer for the credit cards, but to answer your second question, if the fraudster will adapt and will uh, try to change their methodology to um, to, um, to or make frauds, uh, my point of view is as it one may be uh, uh, one of the fear of for example, a bank uh, is that the the scheme of fighting um, is known by the by by, for example, fraudster, and that uh, they can they can use the knowledge of the plan we have to uh, to slip through the net and uh, and make fraud. But but they try, <laughs> and and they will, and the, and they will. One thing about that, because it, it reminds me of game theory. There is a lot of work that is done on game theory and how to, what is the best way to invest to avoid those kind of things. Yes, Mr. Bontempi. Me? <laughs> okay. I comment on that? Okay. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a general comments. I think there is an optimal predictor for avoiding fraud, which is the, the card holder himself. I mean, uh, which means uh, you know, you have the best predictor to know if it's a fraud or not because you made a transaction. It's just to say that if you give me all the information you have about you, I can have the perfect fraud detector. Mm -hmm. So, th but it's again uh, the trade off. I mean, the uncertainty is due to the fact that uh, we, I mean, the, the fraud detector doesn't have all the information. But if you start giving him all the information when you're going to holidays, where do you live, when you go to the restaurant, I'm sure I will detect all your faults. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the, the trade-off we want to have between our privacy and the quality. So it's uh, always against the trade-off you have to find. I mean, it's very easy. You are able to detect what is a fraud. So everyone can do once you give us all the information. It's up to you to decide. Yeah. And you are raising a very interesting uh, question about uh, ethics and the protection of uh, privacy. Yeah. So everyone knows that uh, privacy is uh, a, an elusive word, especially on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and would like to ask the question to the policeman of, the, of our group. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> what about uh, the trade-off between the prote protection of, uh, of privacy and the detection and the tackling of fraud? Interpol yeah, is very is very attentive to ethics. Mm. Uh, that's right. Actually, it's not that easy to answer very uh, precisely in regards to the risks of something new technologies. It is because, yeah, I came here to uh, rather than risk uh, to talk about the opportunities and benefits, mm. and I, I like that. But yeah, like always, when we are talking about the new phenomena or new technology. We, from the uh, Interpol's view, 
we are always approaching in, in those three ways, threat, opportunity, and evidence. And actually, when, in, when it comes to threat, when we are talking about threat, we are all always, the, 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 the main menu is privacy and uh, ethics. So, uh, yeah, I should admit, in, in, in my case, uh, I'm a kind of person who are trying to, willing to interpret very proactively to do something. Usually lawyers are tend to make some logics to not to do, but in my case, I'm very keen to uh, make some logics to do. So in regards to the, the mm, ethics issue or privacy issue, I can say, frankly, I am more open to those issues. Uh, I really want to utilize new technologies, especially in crime prevention area. So that's my idea at this step, personally. Before closing this, uh, this, this uh, very interesting discussion, I would like to, 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 to leave the word to, to the public. If there are in, uh, interventions, uh, people wanting to ask questions or to to make declarations yes <laughs> thank you i'd like to pick up just uh, your statement now um so i work for a bank and um somehow as a customer of a bank um i would like that the bank is helping me preventing fraud which is happening on my account of course but i also care a bit privacy you know i'm swiss so <laughs> So what do you think, um, what do customers in Switzerland, maybe also global, uh, hope the banks are doing and which are the barriers where you, where customers think, well, now you're sneaking around in all my private details and you shouldn't do that. For example, you could do deep crawls in the web and use this information where you're sending money to, all this kind of stuff. What do you think about that? Sorry, sorry. Can I ask you to uh, uh, specify the question or uh, so once more? Okay. Yeah, about the privacy. What what do you think? What do bank customers want? The banks are actually doing, and where is the point where they say no? Please do not sneak too much in my in my privacy details, because I don't want the bank to be investigate too much on my personality. Actually, that's right. Uh, that's one of the points that I am considering. It is because when we are trying to find the suspicious transaction, there is always possibilities the, I, 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 the, the really in, uh, related to fraud or not. And the crucial point is the raise the success rate to the finding the real fraud. And at the same time, uh, suppose we, if we have the real intelligence, we the bank account which was already being used in criminal in fraud, for example, but we are really want to uh, share with bank or uh, uh, any other private sectors so that utilized in crime prevention area. But at the same time, we are also considering the 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 privacy or. What if the customers, what if the bank account holders does not want to share their own information? So that is uh, one of the issue that, that uh, in terms of threat information sharing, we are confronting. So of course I should, we should respect that point of view. And in reality, even though I have a very open mind to do something, in reality, we have many obstacles in regards to uh, internal regulations. Any other comment on that uh, topic? Mm, no. This I have a question. Yes. Uh, well, thanks for the uh, all your talks. And so my question, my question is, well, I present it. So in this convention, we've been seeing approaches to strengthen this, the systems to prevent the fraud after the, the transaction or the payment has been done. And I wonder, is that, in your opinion, cheaper or easier as opposed to empower the, the customer or whoever is actually going to make that request before that happens? So 
instead of having like a massive, say, box or brain that tries to understand the customer and try to make the decision for them as to block it or not, if perhaps there was an approach, a way to help the customer before he, he approves or he makes the payment to the new email address, or is it that maybe, is it easier to, to, to work on making a very strong, very powerful system, or perhaps is it maybe easier to teach or give some tools to the, to the customers? That's the question. I want to make an analogy about the fact, suppose that I know that there is 80% probability there will be an earthquake here now in 20 minutes. Uh, should I tell you or not? I think it's more or less the same. It's about uh, how people are able to manage the risk. I think that I agree. If it was me, I would like that every time I have on my app the probability that some fraud happened with my account. I'm not sure that everyone is able to manage the risk to perceive the risk, I mean, what does it mean if I told you the probability of an earthquake was 75 or 70? I mean, uh, so I guess that taking, uh, managing the risk is not so easy for most people. Uh, and so communicating the risk to someone, uh, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a choice also. But uh, I could say it's, it's quite reality saying that for some people it would be the best idea, but for other people not. So I think it should be reasoned about. Um, I perfectly agree with you. And that's also I wanted <laughs> to say about the same thing. You know, it's the same thing where you can take the example that you have a, a, a deathly disease. Do you want to know or not to know? Some people will say I want, some people not. On the other hand, there are certain risks where you can really reduce this risk a lot by showing people very simple things. You, you showed the, this morning in this email, check the address of the person who sends you the email. Those kind of things, I think we should teach people much more because it's not very difficult. I mean, sometimes it is. I once got an email that was from the French gendarmerie. The address was exactly that. It's just the link below, and I don't know how those guys knew that I was working with them. The link below that was bad. But I, I was told that you need to look, at before you click a link, you check the address below. Do you recognize it or not? Or things like that, yes, I think this would help. But telling the people probability. Yeah. Uh, yes? Yeah. Um, when it comes to credit cards and online transactions, there is this, uh, let's say, protocol that is called Treaty Secure. Um, I guess some of you know it, or most of you know it. Most of you might have even used it. Uh, in principle, it's a, a second factor authentication, or, a, or an additional factor uh, is an authentication for the customer. <coughs> so you get a push notification, or you have a box where you have to place your password, and then um, we kind of authenticate, we as users authenticate you as a customer. You know what the problem is with that? Friction. And people don't want friction. Merchants don't want friction. This is the first, the first uh, thing that I learned when I uh, started with Viseka was that the biggest merchants don't want treaty secure. They prefer to go uh, with the risk of fraud because they, I mean, the number I heard back then, I think is pretty high. I don't, I don't think, um, it even holds, they said that if they introduce treaty secure in this workflow, they might lose 12% of their volume, which is a huge number. If this is the case, then of course I don't want treaty secure. I don't want to give you as a customer the choice to start looking for your password, right? So the, the, the problem is, is more complex than even uh, uh, um, assessing the probability of fraud and letting you know that this is fraud. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, the, the financial part behind it is also critical when uh, giving you or not giving you the choice. Okay, thank you. Is there a, uh, a last question in the... Yes. This is the last question. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for the... Inter uh, first of all, thank you for the inter interesting uh, presentation. So far, very, really good. I just want to come back to the title of this roundtable, Fraudsters versus Data Scientists, who's winning? And basically, 
you said already something to that. Um, just to, to give you a small introduction, um, um, I'm the um, working in a, f a fraud department uh, in a B2B company. So we basically see payment fraud coming in m mostly by invoices, and we also see what you are saying: a, f a fake email address, a fake link, whatever. And what we are see seeing is that we've become through especially through training much better so people now they know th the the old ceo fraud please um pay it to that account and the email is coming in friday afternoon and they they recognize that by now but the frauds are evolving nowadays emails are coming in from from the original email account nowadays um it's not that easy to see my question now is how much do you see an involvement of data and how hard for you will it be or is your maybe maybe your gut instinct to tackle that data? Who wants to answer? Mr. Singh? So you find a sword to break the shield, and then the people come with another shield, and then another sword. I don't think it will end. I am convinced, though, if you look historically, we are, we are becoming much more resilient, contrary to what people say. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a fan of history. Um, when you were traveling from, uh, from uh, Yverdon to Geneva, the chances that you would, ro would be robbed three times in the 13th century was very high. Today, that's gone. Uh, and the same thing, we, we have this new uh, information technology. So the, at the beginning, a lot of things happen. We become more resilient. But people will always find a, a trick, <laughs> I'm sure. Other reaction? No? No, it's all? OK. This was the, the last question. Uh, we finish, uh, we close the discussion a little bit earlier than, uh, than scheduled. Uh, um, and uh, now it's time to go to the last part of the of the conference, which is not in this room. So thank you very much thank for you. your attendance. Thank you very much, Eve. Thank you very much for this.